me just add a few remarks while Harold sets up. Harold was born in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in 1955. He got his bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago and his PhD in physics from Princeton. Uh, he did his postdoctoral research at MIT where he uh, invented the evaporative cooling technique uh, using the magnetic fields uh, that Eric just described. Uh, in 1986, Harold went to Bell Labs uh, where he worked for a decade and, and met Eric Betzig, and they started their uh, collaborative work on microscopy. So Harold will now give a talk on resolving everything, after which the third talk is titled, Resolution is Not Everything. So. <laughs> yes, thanks. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to live up to everything that uh, <laughs> Eric was saying about me, but he sort of, he, he's competitive, and I think this title is another example of the competition, because before I got my title out, Eric had his title out, uh, Resolving is Not Everything, or Resolution is Not Everything, so I had to just go the other way to show him <laughs> there's another approach. Um, so I thought I'd give a, a bit of my path. And it's largely also a little bit through the world of microscopy, and at various points you're going to see a lot of overlap, uh, obviously, between Eric and, uh, and myself, and also maybe see that a little bit of a different perspective, and actually how FSU figures into this place, too. So let me start with resolving, with the resolving first capitalized. Uh, I'll start out as a, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I had the fortune to work uh, at the University of Chicago on uh, a very forward-looking uh, scanning transmission electron microscope, uh, STEM. And uh, that, that was, it was a lot of fun for me, but what was even more exciting was down the hallway, there are another group of people, and I actually have one circled there. I'll get back to him in a second. But they were actually seeing individual atoms, and they actually were able to even see movies of these atoms moving around. And to me, this seems like, gosh, if you can see individual atoms, you're really, your resolution's at its, you know, at its maximum. So uh, I returned to the, the subject of microscopy then about 10 years later, after going through graduate school and the postdoc. And at the time, uh, I was sort of faced, uh, I got a position at at t Bell Labs, and I was faced with the question, well, what can one do? And that was a time when there was just a brand new microscope on the horizon. It was a scanning tunneling probe microscope a couple of years earlier. Uh, Benning and Rohr had uh, you know, publicized that, where you can move a little tip across the surface, a surface, tunnel current between that tip and the surface, and really see atoms. So that seemed a way to go. And at the same time, another big topic came up. Uh, which was higher temperature superconductors. So I thought, okay, here's a, here's a formula for going in, in a new career. Just combine these two ideas. I'm an experimentalist. Uh, one can sort of put together an apparatus. And, uh, and one thing to point out is that superconductors, if they're put in a magnetic field, they can sort of pinch and squeeze the field into single little flux quanta. And I thought, well, okay, maybe one can see the moral equivalent of atoms, but for magnetic fields and constructed a device which can measure magnetic field on a very, very tiny little area, scan it across, and sure enough, yes, you can see little vortices. And that was done in the end of this little cryostat. Uh, a little bit later, one can do this, play the same game by tunneling into it. You can see core states. So that was, that was a lot of fun. We had, and then there were other people at Bell Labs who had also great technology. Uh, one was able to make exactly a single electron transistor. This is current comes down, a little tunnel junction, a little capacitive pad, and then current goes back up this other lead over here. And the conductance here can be modulated by electric field. And it was sensitive enough that you can count individual electrons within the tip of that probe, and you can actually sense uh, individual electrons in, in a surface. And as Eric mentioned, uh, down the hallway, uh, there was another person, and he had a, a version of these scan probe microscopes, uh, and at the time was imaging single molecules. I should point out that uh, Eric was actually a student of the same person uh, who was down the hallway from me back at the University of Chicago uh, doing the electron microscopy. Well, as Eric mentioned, we got together, and 
One experiment, and of course I'll have to explain it my way, uh, <laughs> just to explain it differently, Correct. was to look <laughs> at quantum wells. Uh, quantum wells are semiconductors uh, which can confine an exciton. That's a little electron hole pair and they sort of act like a little atom. And if they're squeezed, their energy shifts to the blue. If they're less squeezed, it shifts to the red. And these structures are used for lasers, for um, diodes, light emitting diodes. And there's an active subject of research. And one big question was, well, uh, how smooth are these surfaces? How can you make better uh, lasers and diodes? And they would actually see that these things would have thickness fluctuations of about a monolayer. So we set out to image it. And sure enough, we could see red areas and bluer areas where the spectrum, if you'd sort of shine light down here and watch these uh, materials fluoresce and glow and luminesce, and you can see there are different colors. And the more pure you can make the color, the better the quality the lasers are. Um, the one thing, as Eric mentioned, is that when we looked at it, we didn't see broad spectral distributions, but we saw very sharp little peaks. And if you look at each one of those peaks in XY two-dimensional space, they look like little donuts, like that. And as Eric again mentioned, you know, one can sort of re-represent that by showing it in a third dimension. Each one of these little flashes, what we're doing in this movie, is we're changing the wavelength that we're looking at the sample. You know, starting from the uh, blue and going to the red uh, in time uh, corresponds to the flashes, which is really a map onto the spectrum. So. You know, and we actually uh, took that little point spread function. You can even fit it to these things. We produced plots like this, got the locations, but you know, didn't think that was really going to be really useful. wasn't going to make for better lasers. So you know, we abandoned it. Uh, Eric started thinking, of course, as you heard, a lot harder and more deeply about it, and really appreciated the, you know, the potential that it had with a, you know, a lot of foresight. But didn't pursue it because these were the Molecules which were available for potential biology just were not narrow spectra like we had in this original experiment. So things were changing. Uh, back at Bell Labs, um, there was a sort of a, a strong mission to make science more relevant to the company. And we we're both sort of feeling you know, the limitations of our uh, respective approaches. And things were happening up at the higher corporate level, AT&T fusions with the NCR. The NCR is National Cash Register, and they make this and more advanced versions of this cash register. Used a lot, for example, in grocery uh, checkout lines. And uh, there's, there's a challenge in everything, and I took that to heart. Uh, so what did I have? Uh, in the lab, there was this apparatus. In fact, there's a part of it which could take uh, a spectrum. And turns out, that NCR was very interested in separating fruit. Uh, they make checkout cash registers, and a big, big problem is fruit do not come with barcodes on it. Is there a way that you can just sort of separate them by sort of poking a wand at them and say, this is a lemon, this is a banana, etc.? And so we set up to train and classify and identify. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, AT&T eventually fizzed with NCR, and AT&T also decided to become a little bit kinder, gentler, became round. And so here we were with this fluorescent uh, concept of a luminescent center, and the new company became Lucent Technologies. So now I'd like to go to the next thing. From that experience and trying to see how does uh, microscopy impact technology, uh, I sort of realized that one has to resolve everything. Uh, Eric went off uh, into his dad's machine tool company, and I was a little bit uh, intrigued by thinking that technology is not just going down to smaller sizes, nano, uh, but actually it's the big, it's the large, it's the massive numbers. You know, trans transistors, they're thousands, millions, billions of them on a computer chip almost, or hard disk drives, you're writing, you know, tiny, tiny little magnetic structures, but again, they're billions or 
trillions of them. And so I just wanted to immerse myself in this uh, you know, notion of large numbers and left Bell and joined this company called Phase Metrics. So the question for me was how to do nanoscale measurements, but do them on a large scale rapidly and quickly. And uh, so, yeah, so this is a little bit the trend. You know, nano things get, were getting smaller and smaller with time, and the numbers, and particularly in the hard disk drive in industry, you're going to generate more and more bits uh, on, a, on a hard disk drive platter. And this has gone up about eight orders of magnitude in the past, you know, scale of, you know, about 40 years. It's a, a amazing progress. So how can we do that? So coming back to the physics, what are some techniques for very fast measurements or nanoscale measurements? And one is just to do interferometry, and that was actually a, a, a tool. You shine light, it can come in through a beam splitter. Some can bounce off of a reference mirror. Some can go down, bounce off of a sample. And these two beams can combine and go into a, a camera. And there's going to be interference from that. And depending on the strength of that interference, you can actually you know, see vertical distances down to the nanometers. And depending on the brightness of the light, you can do it very, very fast. So yeah, here, for example, and if we move the mirror back and forth, you can get uh, you know, different amounts of light going through, calibrate that out. And we actually sort of use that technique, trying to do multiple phase measurements at one time, where you can use those three little fibers, send the light down, have it bounce on a reference mirror, have it bounce, let's say, on the surface of a hard disk drive platter, scan the whole thing in a minute, find all the defects, and do it for uh, accept or reject or quality control uh, things and made some you know, instruments like that. And a little bit later, I was fortunate enough to also be involved in some of the high-end industrial applications of technology for the semiconductor industry. This is an instrument which is probably the most expensive kind of microscope you'll find out there. You know, they cost about on the order of $50 million. And they do mask inspection for uh, computer chips. And back at the time, you know, they would sort of go through a whole chip, but they would have to inspect every last little area of it. You know, this might be a several centimeter area, uh, but down to the 40 nanometer level, or actually even a little bit better, 4 nanometer level. And you can make analogies that it's, a, it's equivalent to scanning all of the United States, all of the roads on it, for potholes. And they have to be perfect. So again, this is trying to resolve everything, the whole, the whole thing at once. There was another trend happening cost. Uh, particularly in the hard disk drive industry, you know, the cost per bit has been shooting down and down and down. Orders of magnitude. And so that leads to other things. Uh, cost of inspection goes up. Uh, we aren't selling equipment. No sales. They're near bankruptcy. And so I was sort of going off in this direction. <laughs> And so, now what? And Eric described that, and we got together, read books, visited universities, talk, think. Um, we try to make our own corporate logos, pretend to be something. <laughs> <laughs> try to reassure ourselves. And Eric inspired me to originally just also jump from the, the company I was in, since I wasn't very happy. He's, he said these inspiring things like, you know, build your wings on your way down. You know, we didn't have a clue what we were going to do. And uh, so I, I took his advice. <laughs> and as Eric mentioned, about 10 years ago, we hit bottom here in Tallahassee. <laughs> and we saw this uh, art, which sort of reflected our hearts. And this building, and we just saw it this afternoon, it still exists. It's out down on Gain Street. So anyway, this is, this is all very dear to us. So here we are, Tallahassee. And here, this is where we found the missing link. I'm just going to restate what Eric stated, but of course differently. Uh, and we were lucky through Greg Bovinger, who was sort of trying to bring me over here, met also Mike Davidson. And he pointed out there's a fluorescent molecule like this. And this, of course, is Mike Davidson's tutorials. He just has wonderful tutorials like this that can sort of explain in pictures things that you are difficult to explain in words. So. If, a fluorescent molecule can glow in one color, you shine blue light on it, and it changes the glowing color. That is photoactivation, and that was magical. This was the missing link to this earlier idea that Eric had. You put two and two together, 
and he came up with this palm microscope idea. And, and this is, you've seen this before. You, you sort of find the centers localized, and I think you've heard the rest of the story. Here's the living room. I'll point out a few other important features. Here's a tennis racket. Here's another tennis racket. <laughs> um, you know, it was nice to see a view out here. We use that to focus our infinity optics, so tune this thing up nicely. Um, computer center back here. Um, it was a lot of fun. It definitely was a lot of fun. And, and in fact, just sort of jumping and not being a job and just sort of having the whole world open up like that was really at, at a big sense of liberation for, I think, for both of us. So fall, winter, here there are two companies, New Quest Research and New Millennia Research. Uh, sort of set up this thing at NIH uh, where we had a real biologist, Jennifer Livencar Schwartz, and the person who really invented a lot of these photoactivated fluorescent proteins, got the data, um, regular microscope, palm microscope, job. <laughs> uh, Eric took the job first. I was a little bit scared about it, uh, so I worked for him for a little while before. I thought, well, it's, it's maybe okay. Um, and this is a remarkable place. This is a place modeling itself after the whole social structure of Bell Labs. And so starting out, then just like starting out at any research job or at Bell Labs, like, what do you do? Uh, Eric initially started extending Palm, and I was thinking, well, gosh, maybe one can do this in three dimensions. And what's the best possible localization that you can do in all three dimensions? with only a certain number of photons. And I was, uh, it was just very fortuitous that I had all this multi-phase interferometry experience, and that just sort of applied so easily into it. So again, interferometry means you can shine light down one side and another photon in the other side, and they go through a beam splitter, and they can interfere. And then depending on the phase of this versus that, you can get either maximum going up the up top leg or a minimum. Uh, but this isn't actually a good way to measure because you have insensitive regions when there's a maximum. So if you change the phase a little bit back and forth, uh, which is what you're trying to measure, uh, there's not much response. While there's a lot of spunts over here on the side uh, when you have the right phase angle. But by going to a multi-way, and this is the whole idea of multi-phase interferometry, you can get several phase angles all at once so that regardless of what the relative phase is of one with respect to the other, you can know the absolute phase and can measure it. And here again is a, another wonderful tutorial made by Mike Davidson, which sort of helps explain that. So you can see a molecule up here between two objective lenses, and if I raise it or lower it by moving it up or down, I'm actually changing the path going through the upper arm versus the lower arm. And so when that photon, it's like a, a two-slit interference, when that photon interferes in this multi-way beam splitter, it shoots it at a certain ratio into camera one, two, or three, depending on where I put it. And that, I sort of gave the name iPalm for interferometry plus palm. And, oops, there we go. And it sort of takes resolution functions in a confocal to something smaller on that size. So a, a way, big improvement in resolution. This little video here, this is just yeast. Dividing. Yeast is very important to microscopy. About half the microscopes, which were sold about 100 years ago, were dedicated to yeast. Brewing beer was a, a big business and very important. And so here we had, uh, we're labeling a particular protein that is used to pinch the yeast off. And there are other examples. These are focal adhesions. These are how cells attach to surfaces or to other structures around. This is a protein uh, in yellow. is a height where it's anchoring to the cover slip itself. And that protein is also sitting in a tubular network just above that surface. And this is the endoplasmic reticulum. We can use uh, this technique of three-dimensional localization to find where proteins sit in 3D on these little plaques and form models like this, again, generated by Mike is, uh, in this rendition here. And there, there are other applications. For example, you might want to ask HIV, might be budding off of a, surf, uh, a cell, 
and there are open questions on certain proteins called escorts, which are used in the budding process. And people are trying to understand, do they work from the outside or do they work from the inside? Well, with the right kind of microscope, you can visualize it and see that it's from the inside and form a model. So when I was at Genelia, sort of another challenge uh, was sort of presenting uh, itself. Um, electron microscopy, and particularly in high resolution. Um, uh, our boss was actually an expert on fruit flies, had sequenced fruit flies, but he was very interested in trying to understand how does the brain, actually how do neural circuits work, and Genelia Farms is centered around two topics, microscopy and understanding neural circuitry. And fruit flies are just sort of a, a, a great uh, you know, a great example. So if you want to see this little brain, uh, it's a three-dimensional object, obviously, you know, about a third of a, a millimeter in size. You have to chop it up very, very fine, maybe eight nanometer, and just imagine imaging a whole block eight nanometers at a time like this. It's a lot of data. There are a lot of voxels, not, not pixels, but voxels for volume. And if you sample it at one megahertz, you're going to be sampling it for about three years. It's a, there's a lot of information inside that fly. And this reminded me a little bit of uh, the experiments which I had when I was in the semiconductor industry. Here you're trying to resolve everything in a fruit fly brain. I and mean, if you miss something, you can't connect the wire or the nerve which went from one side uh, to the other side. And, and the numbers are very comparable. And you say 40 nanometer wire, you can say 40 nanometer dendrite. You say transistor, you could say synapse in, in the areas. Uh, so it was, it was it was interesting. So how do you chop up a fruit fly like this? Again, you can borrow from another industry. The semiconductor industry uses something called focused ion beam sectioning as one of the tools for uh, you know, looking at things. So you can initially have an electron beam that scans a block surface of a fly. You polish it off with gallium atoms, and so you remove a few nanometers. And now you look at it, the new surface again, with an electron microscopy. And you do this over and over and over for uh, you know, days, weeks, months, as long as you can keep the machine going. And you get three-dimensional volumes that look isotropic like this. And here, each one of these little processes is one little dendrite of, of, uh, you know, of, of the you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, cells in a, in a fly. And you can even see sometimes little dark things forming in here. Those are synapses. And so if you apply that, here is a, you know, an example whoops, of that type of data, uh, looking at the optic lobe of a fly. So this part right here, this is the retina, you know, essentially it's eyeball. And there are modules in here where the, each one of the little uh, omnitidia part of the eye, the information is all collapsed together in a little columnar way. And there's just a massive amount of interconnectivity you know, hundred, several hundred different types of uh, neurons which are involved. So you take this data, uh, a small, let's say, 30 micron area, and it still takes about uh, 12 person years to really correctly uh, deconvolve this and reconstruct what the circuitry is like. And the ambitions get bigger. Initially, looking at a small part of the brain, now we can, with improving the instrumentation, we just scale up focusing on this everything. There, here are three large modules associated with the optic uh, lobe of the fruit fly. And the movie, the motion, what you're seeing is we're just sort of going in deeper and deeper into the surface. We can sort of crop in, zoom in a little bit, and uh, once the movie starts, this will, uh, this, this is actually part of a three month run to collect this data. And what you can see here, these are like the wiring. You see like there's a whole set of wiring going this way, and then it's braided, and it sort of shoots that way. It's all very intricate and interleaved. And now we're, we're zooming in. We start out about 150 microns. Here you see a cell body. There are little cell bodies stuck in between here. The little dark things that you see at this level, these are mitochondria. We're going to zoom in, and you'll see them in more detail again. And so zooming a little bit slowly.
And actually, you know, at some point, you'll begin to see in some of these structures tiny little dots or lines which move across. And these are actually the microtubules, uh, which are also associated with it. You know, very small structures. This, we're resolving this at about 8 nanometers resolution. And so now we're about 10x finer zoom. These little structures right here, the little dark things, these are synapses. That's the, essentially where the communication takes place between nerves. Okay, so <clears throat> now having both kinds of microscopes, you know, in-house, in it would be fun to, you know, to overlay them. And actually this comes back to an experiment that Eric and I had to do in order to get published. You know, we originally, when we did the palm experiment, we just saw the palm, in other words, the fluorescent signal, but it was sort of with respect to darkness. And of course, ourselves, you know, we're wondering, well, how can we really trust it? Is it an artifact? Is it real? Uh, by going in there, doing an EM experiment of exactly that same sample, we could identify dark regions. They were the mitochondria. We overlapped. And now we have a lot more context. And this general principle is, I think, going to be an important direction in the future. And particularly for high resolution microscopes, if you can match electron microscope resolution with the super resolution, you have the potential for saying, ah, I know where this particular protein is, as opposed to saying it's in this vague general area. And the protein, what you're seeing right here, is a pro the, the structure you're seeing here is a mitochondria, and it has a little Christi in it. And the protein you're seeing here is a DNA, mitochondrial DNA, at a very specific location. But there are a lot of challenges to make that work, but there are a lot of resources. At Genealia, you have a person who can actually re-engineer these proteins uh, to make them tolerant to the processes uh, you know, for both electron microscope preparation and for optical visualization. Uh, make them fluoresce, tolerant to some of the stains. And I'll just show you some picture here. Where we can, or sorry, expanding this ability to do correlative microscopy. Again, here we're, we're improving the quality of the data so that when we actually see the Christie for the samples and label the uh, specific proteins. And there are also alternate ways to explore imaging modalities too. One can sort of use this iPalm together with the FibSem. These are the two technologies. Get a three-dimensional data stack here, get this three-dimensional data stack, and overlay them. Uh, and, and see again here, these are these mitochondrial DNAs, where exactly they sit in the mitochondria. And they have their own little pockets away from the Christie where they live. And here's a movie just sort of demonstrating the same thing one more time. Here's the mitochondria right here, and the red are the proteins specific to its DNA. So, trying to put all that together, and as a general statement, you know, what I see in looking at this field, there's, there's just sort of an explosion of uh, imaging methods, and Eric's going to continue to talk about that. And there's also an explosion of protocols. How do you prepare the sample? And, and to me, this, this little image of the Cambrian explosion of different kinds of life forms uh, sort of describes it, you know, or it gives a picture. You know, we're really exploring all sorts of possibilities, almost somewhat randomly, that there are going to be, there's just a richness of uh, directions that one can go into on this. And of course, you know, need to thank a lot of people. And Eric Betzik, of course, has been very key. You know, we do compete and we keep ourselves at, uh, you know, at best, otherwise, you know, we'd be boring. And, uh, of course, a ton of other people, you know, are, are, are critical to this. But now I just want to come back to this resolving everything. You know, and this is more on a personal note. I mean, we were in trouble <laughs> and we did come here and I think we're definitely very thankful, you know, certainly to Greg Bovinger. To, you know, to, to listen to a few homeless folks, and certainly to uh, uh, to Mike Davidson also to you know just connect us even more to the sort of the rich world of what's happening in the biology. And like, thank you for your attention too.